Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for Becoming a Specialty Lens Practice and Billing and Coding for Scleral Lenses. Um, this is the fifth and final webinar in this series for 2017, but watch for the information on the next series starting in 2018. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Andrew Biondo. Uh, Dr. Biondo works in a private practice in St. Louis, Missouri. He is currently the president of the St. Louis Optometric Society and a member of the Missouri Optometric Association, the Academy, or the American Academy of Optometry, and the AOA. He is also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, Dr. Biondo lectures nationally on a wide variety of specialty contact lenses, concentrating on scleral for patients with keratoconus, severe dry eye disease, and other corneal abnormalities. Um, as well as practice management. Um, before I turn it over to Dr. Biondo tonight, um, you will have an opportunity after the lecture is over to ask questions. So if you just type in your questions, at the end I will read them and uh, um, Dr. Biondo will answer them for you. Dr. Biondo? Just a second, let me get him off of mute. Okay, I think that uh, I think that worked. I think we're ready to go. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you everybody for logging in tonight. Uh, yeah, this is like Kathy said, the final uh, in the webinar series. If you missed any of the previous ones, they are all up on uh, ExcelSpecialtyContacts.com under the Education tab. So, and this one will be as well. Uh, we'll spend probably the majority of the time on billing and coding, and we like to keep these relatively short, between 45 minutes and, and an hour. And so uh, there's a lot to cover with billing and coding. We're not going to obviously be able to cover all of it in that short period of time. And, and I will go somewhat quickly through it. So uh, feel free to go back on and, and uh, re-watch this tomorrow if you'd like to. And I think you'll actually be getting a, uh, a follow-up email that will include a link to, to re-watch this tomorrow. So um, just a couple disclosures here before we get started. Uh, I am not a, a billing and coding expert. I don't work for any billing and coding company, nor do I work for the insurance companies uh, to which we bill. So uh, everything I'll be talking about is just based on my opinions and experiences, and you should always refer to your own individual provider agreements uh, before you make any decisions on what to bill or how to bill or how much to bill. Uh, I am a paid consultant and lecturer for Excel, and I'm a committee chairman for the uh, Sclera Lens Education Society. So. Uh, with billing and coding, there, there really is no single right answer when it comes to billing for scleral contacts. Uh, we're still learning a lot about it. Uh, there, there's kind of three ways to, to look at it. There's medical, there's vision, there's cash. Uh, two of them are pretty straightforward. Cash and, and vision have become very streamlined, I feel like, now, and we'll go over those in detail. Medical is still a bit of a crapshoot, and uh, there's some things you can do to, to increase your odds, but for the most part, you can anticipate not usually being paid all that well through medical and uh, if you have to bill it then, then there's a few ways you can try to recoup some of that money uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit toward the end here as well. So different insurance companies require different things. Uh, if we're looking at cash pricing which is where we'll start, uh, you have to really think about how much it costs to fit a scleral lens patient. There, there's not only the, the financial investment but the temporal investment, the time you put into these patients. So if we start just with the financial investment, obviously you need materials, you need the, the lenses, which will usually range between $100 and uh, $200 per eye. You need the fit sets, which require an upfront investment. You need saline, dispensing towels, the DMVs, the fluorescein, everything you need to fit these patients with. Uh, testing equipment, topographer is kind of a must. OCT is optional, but, but definitely very helpful. And then all the staff time when you're paying your staff to answer the additional phone calls, right, to do the insertion removal testing, to do troubleshooting with these patients, and, and handle all of the issues that come about with specialty contact lenses. <clears throat> and I, like I said, there's also your time. So I, I kind of like to think a minimum of four visits when I see a scleral lens patient, and that's 
usually kind of best case scenario. You have the, the exam slash consultation, which can take a good amount of time. Patient, patients usually have a lot of questions about scleral lenses when they walk in your door. The fitting, which can be combined with, with consultation, but oftentimes is rescheduled just for uh, streamlining purposes. The dispensing visit, the follow-up. So we're looking at a kind of a minimum of, of four visits there. And when you think about that, each one of those could be replaced by a standard patient, right? A patient that walks in with regular contacts or glasses. And, and how much would you be making if you saw one of them versus a scleral lens patient? So the, the, the formula that, that I kind of like to go by when people ask me, how much should I charge for this? is we have to look at how much are those spots worth. And if you figure an average of four visits per scleral lens patient, right, uh, you need to figure out what, what, what's your average revenue per time slot. And, and the national average, when I looked this up, when I did this lecture a year and a half ago, was $320. Uh, it was the average revenue per exam. So if you multiply that by four, you're looking at about $1,300. Uh, you should be charging these patients to take up those four exam slots. And that should be the minimum because, again, we, we require the time it takes to fit these patients, those four slots, the expense of the materials that go into fitting these patients, and then obviously your expertise. This isn't something people can just walk into any eye doctor's office and get. They aren't, aren't something you can go online and take an exam and, and order from a website. It requires a certain amount of expertise to fit a scleral lens. And, and you should value that expertise in yourself and the patient should value that financially when, when they compensate you for your services. Uh, care credit can definitely help with that. We offer care credit at our practice. I find it to be beneficial uh, I'm sure most people take it, even if you don't do specialty contact lenses, a lot of people take care credit for a lot of other reasons, even for glasses in a lot of cases. Um, the one issue is a lot of people who can't afford scleral lens services may not have strong credit also. And uh, if they don't have strong credit, they may not qualify for care credit. In-house financing is very risky. I know we've gotten burned uh, a few times on that at our practice. Um, but you can do it. You can, you, can, you can have people kind of break down into, into a payment structure, a payment plan, if you trust them enough to do it. So every patient that I fit in a scleral lens signs a fitting agreement. And they sign this agreement whether they pay cash or whether their insurance pays uh, for their fitting lenses. And that way they kind of know how much this, this, uh, this whole procedure costs. And if they need replacement lenses, how much those are going to cost and how much time they have to make any changes to these lenses. So just like any contact lens fitting, you really want to separate your, your fitting fee from the materials itself. The main reason being if rarely ever you have somebody who fails in scleral lenses, you're not going to refund your fitting fee. You're only going to refund the, the price of your contacts. Um, and I also like to do this just because I can really break down and show the patient how much those contacts cost. And I like to establish that up front because if they step on one down the road or break one or lose one or want a backup pair, you need to kind of have a good idea of what it's going to cost to replace that. For that reason as well, if I ever discount my fees, which I rarely ever do, but if I'm ever going to do that, I always discount my professional services. And that way in the future, because if I don't refit a patient at a year, I may not charge them a full fit fee again. I may just charge them a contact lens assessment fee if we don't really change much. They're just updating their lens, uh, which is much cheaper. I usually charge $129 for that. Uh, in the future, I want to be able to protect my profit. And so I, I never discount this fee just to kind of establish the fact that that fee is non-negotiable. That's how much the contacts cost. And just like a soft lens, you wouldn't discount a Biofinity. I don't discount a scleral lens. So if I walk my foot and I'm going to give them a discount because they just can't afford the services, I always tell them I can't discount the materials, but I can discount my services for you, and I can take 25% uh, or 50% off my service portion of the fitting. I also, I used to split my fitting fee into two. So I would do it per eye. I would do $400 per eye as a fitting fee. But I realized pretty quickly that it wasn't fair to me to only collect half of my fitting fee to fit one eye because the amount of time I invest in that patient and that fitting doesn't go down by half if I only fit one eye. They, ha they have the same number of visits. And, and if you're fitting scleral lenses right now, you probably know this, but once you fit the first eye, uh, the vast majority of patients, the second eye is pretty darn quick, right? The, the first eye is a tough one. And usually there's at least some sort of symmetry, or at least, you know, you just have to adjust the sag a little bit for the second eye, but the scleral fit's going to be the same. So uh, I, I don't break this up in, into uh, monocular pricing anymore. Insurance looks at it as, as a bilateral code, which is kind of nice because if you only fit one eye and you build this to VSP, you only get one eye's worth of material, but you will get your, your full fitting fee of, of 800 instead of 400. So I really do think that you should 
always charge the same fit whether you're doing one eye or two eyes. It also helps keep the patient from deciding to only do one eye when they really need to be fitting two because one eye is maybe slightly more functional than the other. Something I've changed kind of recently. So with vision plans, uh, the, the most important lesson I think I can give you is just don't exceed your usual and customary. I think a lot of doctors see, uh, hey, IMED will pay me up to $2,500 for this visual improvement patient. I'm going to charge $2,500 when the usual and customary, say for me, is $1,700. Uh, and you're seeing more and more vision plans, especially VSP and IMED, uh, coming back and auditing a lot of these uh, medical necessary, visual necessary contact lens cases. And when they do that, you better have a darn good reason why you charge them more uh, th than you charge a cash paying patient. And that's going to be very hard to justify, just like you couldn't justify to Medicare why you charge uh, them $100 for a visual field when you charge a cash pay, maybe $40 for a visual field. They're not going to buy that. And VSP and IMED don't either. And they've gotten pretty aggressive about uh, not only auditing, but enforcing uh, the audits. And I know some people have gotten burned pretty bad on that. So stick to your usual and customary, whatever that is, whatever you charge a patient cash pay you're going to charge VSP and IMED the same thing, regardless of what their allowable is. Because the allowable is that bright, shiny object you have to kind of resist. Each has different requirements. We'll go through VSP and IMED kind of in detail here. And then I've got a slide. We'll talk about some of the other ones that are available. Most vision plans are now, almost all of them I see, regardless of how bad the vision plan is, most of them now do have some form of medically necessary coverage, whether it's full coverage or just uh, an extension of their usual coverage for a couple hundred bucks or something like that, at least they're starting to all move toward covering medically necessary contact lenses. The big thing is just like <clears throat> for a medical uh, procedure like a field or punctal plugs or an amniotic membrane, you really need to document everything, why you did it, how you did it, and, and, and that you did it. And the chief complaint might be one of the most important parts that that's, that's kind of overlooked. You need to make sure you have complaints like blurry vision and glare for a keratoconus patient because that's what they have. And you need to be able to also talk about what they failed and why they have to be in a scleral lens, which is much more expensive than a corneal GP or a standard soft lens. Maybe they failed soft lenses because of vision. They failed corneal GPs because of fit. The, the lens wouldn't center. It was uncomfortable, whatever it might be. They can't do spectacles because of vision. They have to be in a scleral lens. Document that. Document that. Document that. Document that. Uh, and put that all in the chief complaint so that if somebody is reading that chart in an audit, they say, I understand why this patient is being put in or prescribed scleral lenses at this visit, why they're here for this fitting. And then obviously show findings. You can say they have keratoconus to your blue in the face, but if your exam note doesn't have votes dry A or ectasia or central thinning or haze or whatever it might be noted in the cornea, so you can't tell that they have keratoconus, it, it's all pretty much null and void. And then obviously, you want to back that up with testing, whether it's uh, um, topography is the most obvious, pachymetry, uh, OCT testing, whatever it might be. Anything you can put in that chart to back up your case for fitting this patient in a specialty contact, do it. You don't need to be scared of these audits because uh, if you do everything right, you do everything by the book, and you fit patients that should be fit, and you show in your chart why, you'll pass them. And so don't be afraid to do it. But just be careful and don't get greedy because we all kind of assume vision companies don't audit like Medicare does. Well, they're starting to, especially on these. Vision care companies like to pay out 25 bucks, 50 bucks at a time. They don't like to pay out $1,700, $2,500 at a time. And so they're, they're starting to kind of fight back on that a little bit. Another thing to, to remember and, and to really remind your patients is that if they use their benefit for glasses, they cannot use it for medically necessary contacts. It's just like uh, uh, elective contacts, soft contacts. You get for one or the other and they can nullify their medical necessary contact benefit by using it on, on materials like glasses. I had it happen a couple times. I have people drive in from a few hours away to get fit with sclerals and say they get fit in November and we do a medical necessary fit and then they take a glasses script with them and go buy glasses closer to home. Very understandable. Uh, they then go home and let's say the next year rolls over and it's February and they get some glasses just to wear as kind of backups and they burn their VSP benefit or whatever it happens to be that year, well, then they're not eligible that year for, for contact lens benefits and their medically necessary contact lenses, which would be $900 for the materials as opposed to a pair of glasses, which could be much less. So remind patients of that and make sure they understand that. VSP and IMED have both gotten very streamlined as far as allowing you to build medically necessary. You used to have to call and get a special authorization uh, and jump through some hoops and decide if they even have the coverage. Now, it pretty much tells you I still recommend and I have my staff call on every single patient, even if it says on their sheet that they have, as you can see here, necessary contact lens coverage. 
with a copay in this case. I still call because you need to ask the question, are these patients covered at 100%? Uh, because I have had this happen rarely. And I think it's only happened once, maybe twice, but they were covered. Uh, I think it got burned once and we caught another one. They had this written on their sheet, necessary contact lenses covered, but they were only covered up to their allowable of $150. So you have to ask the question, are they covered at 100% and the answer be yes or no, they're covered up to their, their contact lens material allowance. Again, that's rare, but it has happened. And if you just go by this, you're not going to get paid. And you have to explain to the patient why they owe you a lot of money on the backside there. So call both BSP and IMED. Just ask if they're at 100%. And then you just generate a normal contact lens off and use that to, uh, to, build, the, uh, to build a fitting for. This is just a big list of everything you'll pull out on the, on the VSP sheet. I'll show you a picture of it on the next slide here. One thing to note, there's really two fitting codes for scleral lenses. 92072 is officially just for keratoconus, and it's just for keratoconus initial fitting. There's some debate as to exactly what initial fitting means. Is it the first time that patient's ever been fit in a contact lens, or is it the first time you ever fit them in a contact lens? I don't know the exact answer. Uh, most people tend to think it's probably the first time you fit them in a contact lens, but it seems to be somewhat open for interpretation. <clears throat> the other code, once they've been fit once or they don't have keratoconus, is 92313. That's a corneal scleral fitting, but it's the closest thing we have to a scleral fitting. This will use for anybody who does not have keratoconus or if it's not their initial fitting. Use 92313. VSP will give you the option for both. And then V2531 is the scleral lens V code that you'll use. So if we go to the next slide here, you can see as you fill out this form, I never do an exam the same day as I do a fitting for medically necessary contacts. Uh, you'll do your V2531 for your scleral code. You'll put necessary here where you usually put elective for your average patient, but necessary contact lenses. If it's the initial fit, 92072 in this drop down. If it's a subsequent fit, in other words, if they've been fit before or if they don't have keratoconus, you'll put the 92313 here and it'll say scler corneal scleral lens fitting. Other, other. Here I put two in my number of boxes. I'm going to give them two lenses if it's a bilateral fit and a conventional one year replacement is what I recommend sclerals are replaced at. I have heard of people who will put four in this box and six months in this. In other words, they recommend patients throw away their lenses, their scleral lenses every six months, and so they then bill VSP for uh, four contacts total for bilateral fit. I don't do that. I don't know how VSP feels about that. If you can, I guess, show that that's how you treat every patient that walks in your door, I, I guess you could be justified in, in, in doing that. Um, again, it's not something I do, so I don't have any, I can't speak uh, from experience there, but it, it's something that some people have talked about. Again, then you'll put a, uh, a diagnosis code in the box here. It has to be a medical code, obviously. This would be bilateral, sterile, uh, stable keratoconus. Calculate the uh, hick picks or whatever, and, and then down here, your uh, your, your material and, and fit fee will show up and you can label your charges appropriately. This, I made this a while ago now for my fitting fee, I always put one unit because this is now a bilateral code. So uh, I'll put a one here and a two if I'm fitting both eyes under the material code. The last thing on VSP you always have to do or whoever does your submission has to do uh, is fill out box 19. They require this for medical necessary fits to get full uh, reimbursement. And in box 19, they want to know what lab and what uh, type of scleral lens you're using. So I'll write, say, the Atlanta Scleral Lens OU from Excel Specialty Contacts. If you're using a hybrid lens, you can do the same thing. They still want you to fill out box 19. So let them know what lab it's from and what design you're using there. <clears throat> VSP will cover a whole lot of different types of codes. Uh, it's all listed under your provider manual. Uh, the big ones you'll probably do are going to be keratoconus. Um, corneal transplant, the uh, Z94.7, um, uh, or maybe uh, corneal opacity like an H17.89, which will be used a lot of times for uh, post-RK patients who don't see a lot of glasses. <clears throat> IMED is now very easy as well. They've kind of gone through uh, quite the maturation over the past few years as far as the way you had to submit these things. It was kind of a mess in the beginning. Then they had this form that kind of cleaned it all up, and now it's pretty much done online. Some of the older plans, you still have a form. It's a one-page form, very self-explanatory. Uh, again, you just have to generate a contact lens off. Don't have to call for any kind of special uh, medically necessary authorization. Uh, but I do still call and make sure they're covered at 100% for these patients when my front desk does call. <clears throat> so here, you can just see, 
It's not a disposable contact. This was one thing that's kind of confusing. I still don't have a good answer for this yet. Under material, when I'm doing a medically necessary contact, a lot of times I'll do this V2599, which just says other. There is a code in this drop down that says uh, V2510, which is your rigid gas permeable, and it says next to it rigid gas permeable. Now, technically, it is a rigid gas permeable lens, a scleral lens is, but V2510 is the corneal uh, RGP code. So it, it's, I'm not really sure if that's what they're looking for, even though it is a GP material. This is definitely what you use for a hybrid is the other. I use that for my sclerals as well. And again, I'll put yes for medically necessary. And then there's only really five options you can pick from on your drop down for what the diagnosis code is. And we'll go over those in a second here. The premium fit, that Z code is, is auto populated. <clears throat> and then you just put in your usual and customary charge as one lump sum. If it's a bilateral fit for me at 1700. For mild to moderate keratoconus, they will pay a maximum allowable of $1,200 on that. So here we can see the, the IMED fee schedule. There's two types of keratoconus uh, that you can uh, apply for under medical necessary, mild to moderate or moderate to severe. And they used to not really give us a whole lot of, uh, of guidance on this, but now we kind of know that, uh, A, you have to be able to prove they have keratoconus in either of these. That's obvious. Mild to moderate is defined as a steep K less than 53 diopters and packs over 475 whereas moderate severe would be over 53 diopters steep K and packs under <clears throat> 475. And they also note refraction not measurable. I rarely bill up here, but it does pay a lot better. I, I make sure I, I, I'm really kind of way clear of those marks and the refraction really isn't measurable before I do that. But you get reimbursed a lot better if it's a moderate to severe keratoconus. For pretty much everything else for a scleral lens that's not keratoconus, you use the visual improvement code assuming it applies. Visual improvement just says you can improve uh, their vision, two lines over manifest, by using whatever modality you're going to use, in this case a scleral lens. And so obviously make sure you, you, you document their manifest and make sure you document your, your GP vision, make sure it's two lines better, but they'll pay up to $2,500 on that. Um, and again, this is in the absence of keratoconus. So that's great for post-corneal transplant patients, and that's great for post-RK patients. <clears throat> and, and then... They also pay for high amotropia and anisometropia up to $700 in addition. So other vision plans work a little bit differently. VSP and IMED will kind of let you bill whoever you want, and then they may come back and audit you on the, on the back end. Most of the other vision plans that usually don't pay quite as well as VSP or IMED, although Spectera I know I think pays up to like $1,500, uh, and there's some other ones that, that pay pretty decently. <clears throat> they ask you to basically fill out a form that they'll fax you, and fax it back to them with supporting documentation, like your exam note that shows manifest in Ks and, and findings, uh, topographies, uh, and then usually a CMS form with, with all of the charges on it. So you do that, then they approve you, and then, the, then they'll reimburse you up to a certain amount, depending on what plan it is uh, for some of the charges. But all you have to do with the other vision plans is just call them, and they'll tell you what they need, and they'll fax you the appropriate documentation. <clears throat> Again, for medical, it can be very difficult. Sometimes you get surprised by medical. I always say if you have a keratoconus patient coming in, have staff call. Have staff call their medical insurance, ask if they have vision coverage in general. They may or may not. Sometimes they have vision coverage through their medical plan that's not even a separate vision plan. And sometimes they have medical necessary riders through that as well. And that happens more often than you think, especially if they don't have any type of vision plan on the side. Uh, if that's the case, you can bill it. I had one plan that was interesting that they would cover and pay up to 95% usual and customary on a contact lens fitting one time after corneal transplant. And so somebody had a transplant, we were able to fit them in scleral lenses. They are then responsible for the material fee down the road, but they got the initial fit covered pretty much in full. <clears throat> Again, uh, whereas, whereas vision insurance, you kind of bill it all off as a lump sum. In medical insurance, everything is itemized. You either use your 92072 if it's your initial fitting, uh, in Missouri, our medical allowable in my city is 132 bucks for that, which is pretty bad. 92313 would be a scleral lens fitting for non-keratoconus patients or keratoconus patients you've fit before. I find that it's rarely covered. That's usually the one that I ask about when I call, and if they say, no, it's not covered, I say, okay, and that patient becomes a cash pay patient at that point. The thing you can do if you bill medically, even though you don't get reimbursed well for the fit, is every follow-up, including the dispensing and every follow-up thereafter, can be billed as a medical follow-up with a 99213 code. Again, have a chief complaint and an exam and a diagnosis uh, consistent with a, a follow-up, but at least you can bill it off that way. And then you can also try to bill the lenses 
those are um, unilateral codes that you'll need an RT and LT modifier with. <clears throat> One thing that's kind of cool you can do through medical insurance that pays very well is treat dry eye with scleral lenses. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this by now, but it's referred to as a scleral shell, and it's just the utilization of a scleral lens to treat a dry eye of a diverse etiology, in other words, of, of really any reason. And, and the code is V27, or I'm sorry, 2627, and, and that's a bundled code. It, it includes both the material and the fitting fee. So let's say you charge $1,700 for a bilateral fit, it would be $850 under the RT, $850 under the LT. And they reimburse, I've, I've read in one place over $1,200 per eye, depending on the plan and, and depending on what kind of uh, medical insurance they have. And, and sometimes I've heard over $2,500 per eye. Again, bill your usual and customary, but they reimburse very well. You usually get paid in full on these patients. Uh, use your dry eye diagnosis for this. And just make sure you, again, just like with a medical, uh, I'm sorry, a vision uh, plan, make sure you document the heck out of it. Make sure you have good documentation of their dry eye, note all the symptoms the patient's having, and note all the failed treatments like steroid drops or stasis, punctal plugs, whatever it might be, bandaged contact lenses in the past that have brought them to the point where a scleral lens is now necessary. But commercial pays very well. I've never been rejected by commercial. Um, and, and assuming deductibles have been met, they always do pay. Medicare will pay as well. The, uh, the quirk there is you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, bill through DMERC. So Medicare itself will not reimburse on this. You have to go through DMERC. Again, same codes. You have to put this KX modifier to signify that's medically necessary if you bill through DMERC as well. So that's kind of a pain for some people who don't take DMERC, but any commercial pay for people under the age of 65, um, or if they have an Advantage plan a lot of times, it'll still cover. I, I still call on the Advantage plans. Those have been kind of hit or miss for Medicare, but if you bill straight to Medicare, they will reject it if it's not put through DMERC. That's all I have for the billing and coding. Again, if I know I went kind of quickly. If you have some questions, give them to Kathy for the end, and then again, this will be sent out as a recording. I have just a few slides here now on kind of building and, and, and establishing yourself as a scleral lens practice. Uh, I would say 70% of the fits that I get now are probably through referrals, and um, it, it's pretty obvious. You know, you just have to get out there and establish yourself as a scleral lens fitter and as a scleral lens expert. Corneal specialists are still going to be the best place to go. They're the ones who are going to see the messed up corneas, and so it just kind of makes sense. You got to find ones that don't have optometrists on staff. A lot of times, hospital-based <clears throat> uh, corneal specialists do well, even though they have a lot of contact. Or I'm sorry, optometrists who work at hospitals now. A lot of times, they don't have uh, a dedicated scleral lens specialist, and I found that to be very successful for me. Refractive surgeons get a lot. I actually, my first job out of school was at a ODMD practice that did a lot of refractive surgery, and I got a lot of scleral lens fits because a lot of undiagnosed cones would walk in and say, I can't see out of my soft lenses. They're uncomfortable to wear. I want LASIK. And the surgeon would say, well, you don't qualify. You have keratoconus. Go see Dr. Biano. will get you fit in scleral lens. So get to know your refractive surgeons very well. And put glaucoma specialists here, not because necessarily they're a really good referral source, but because just in my case, I have a glaucoma specialist who sends me a lot of cases. And it just goes to show you, it doesn't really matter uh, who it is. Any really surgeon who doesn't want to deal with contact lens fittings and just wants a good place to send them, who sees a lot of patients on a daily basis, will come across people who have issues, whether it's severe dry eye or irregular cornea or have had transplants or whatever the case may be. Uh, it is not, there's not a, a minimum amount of people you can tell about what you do, especially in the ophthalmology world where they don't want to deal with this kind of stuff. And always follow up every referral you get with a, with a referral letter. And make it short, make it sweet. Don't make it like the one they made you write in optometry school that talks about the patient's IOP and their vessels and their optic nerve and all that kind of stuff. These people have typically already seen these patients. Send back, thank them for the referral, tell them what vision you got out of them, tell them they're comfortable in their sclerosis and that they're doing great. Thank them again at the end. If I can do anything else for you, let me know. Get your face or get your name in front of their face just one more time that way. Uh, looking within, I would say when I made this slide, I, I just kind of went through random thoughts in my head, but if you put these first three bullet points together, it makes the perfect scleral lens patient for regular corneas. It's a presbyopic patient who's dry in their contacts and has astigmatism. So they don't qualify for multifocals, right, because they got that astigmatism. They dehydrate their lenses, and they need something for up close. And now we've had these great uh, scleral lens multifocals that treat dryness, that give you GP quality vision, that cover up sill. And so now I have so many presbyopic patients that I give the options to for soft monovision, soft multifocals, 
or scleral lens multifocals. And I say, here's the advantages and disadvantages of all of them. Sclerals give you the best vision and they probably give you the best comfort because they don't dry out, but there's a cost associated with them and you only get one per year. You don't quite have the convenience. But it's like I have a lot of people who, who choose that route and it gives us a whole new option for the person who fits all three of these, which if you think about people over the age of 50, a lot of them fit into that category there. So that's very, very cool. Uh, cur current GP wears, obviously are great candidates. Anybody post-refractive, I really try to keep them out of soft lenses because they just don't lay right. They don't fit right. They move too much. Uh, they don't give that good a vision, especially people with LASIK before we had really good wavefront optimized uh, laser, laser platforms. And then obviously any irregular cornea you find in your practice. And then I think dry eye, as far as going out and recruiting to ophthalmology, the one thing I found that outside of the corneal specialists, one thing that general ophthalmologists really take to is dry eye and the dry eye treatment through the use of scleral lenses. Because your general ophthalmologist will do what we'll do. They'll put uh, punctal plugs in, they'll put them on Lotomax, they'll put them on Zyde uh, they'll, they'll do gland expression or, or lipoflow or whatever it might be. <laughs> and then when they run out of options, they, you know, they, they, they're busy. They don't really want to deal with it. You can be their next option. I have this scleral lens. It's great for dry eye patients. It, 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 it's often covered by medical insurance under that uh, scleral shell code. And I've gotten a lot of referrals just from dry eye uh, fr from just general cataract type surgeons or general ophthalmologists in the area here. <clears throat> as far as external marketing goes, I really don't spend any money on marketing because I want to market just to people who want scleral lenses and people with dry eye. And I think a lot of us now, that's kind of where we find we need, we need to head our practices as we have more competition from online retailers, both in the contact lens segment and in the, the spectacle segment. And I think as much as we kind of quote unquote hate uh, what the internet's done to our, our profession. What it's done for small business in general is actually really, really, really cool. We can now uh, on a very small marketing budget effectively market to our target audience uh, on, on a daily basis through the use of Google AdWords and Facebook. And uh, they have this new Facebook pixel, which I don't really understand, but I have somebody who does understand it. And I, I spend money every month that I get great returns on uh, just targeting people who search things like keratoconus and scleral lenses and dry eye on the internet. And I show up and on their searches or I show up next to their searches or I show up when they go to Macy's.com on the little ad space on the side and we get great feedback from that. Um, and it allows me to run a very limited budget. You know, a lot of us don't have big budgets to go on print or radio or TV uh, that would be just to a general audience that's not really 99% of which don't, don't want what we're offering. Right now we can really target that. So. I'd encourage you to do research on that. It's a whole other lecture in and of itself. And again, I'm not an expert in that area, but find somebody who is. And it doesn't have to be a big company. It can be, a lot of times there, there's people who do it independently on the side. It can be a friend or family member who just understands SEO. And, 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 and a lot of times even the people who do your website by paying them a little bit extra will, will do a lot of these things for you. And it really pays big dividends for a very, very small investment. As far as setting up your practice, there's the obvious things. One thing I would say is if you want to look like you know what you're doing, have everything you need to fit a scleral lens patient in every exam room. Have the saline in there, the plungers, the DMVs, the fluorescein, the, uh, the dispensing towels, all that kind of stuff. So all you have to do is go grab a fit set, bring it in, and start fitting a patient uh, whenever you need to. It'll, it'll make you look like you're a scleral, a scleral lens practice, and it'll, it'll improve office flow. <clears throat> One thing you got to be really careful of, and, and I'll tell you, I get a lot of this, I, I hear a lot of this from patients, is, is patients walk in and they tell me, I saw this other optometrist for years, and uh, they told me about this scleral lens thing, and it sounded pretty cool, but then they wanted to bring this rep in, and they said they'd never done it before, and they said, hey, we'll be learning together, and you can be my guinea pig. And I'll tell you right now, patients hate that. <laughs> they don't want to be guinea pig, especially when they have a condition that they're fearful of, like keratoconus, which can be visually debilitating to some degree. <clears throat> they don't want to be your first uh, your first time, okay? So uh, you can still bring reps in, and it's very beneficial to bring reps in. Excel does a great job of flying reps out to you uh, to help fit your patients. But what you don't want to do is, is kind of admit how much of a novice you are to those patients. It's not bad to have a rep there with you fitting, but don't let that, don't let that rep uh, be the leader and you be the assistant. You be the leader, and the rep can be there to give you a few tips along the way. Uh, I have a buddy who does that for orthopedic surgeons. He works for a company that sells screws for trauma patients and, and he sits there and gives the surgeons tips in the operating room. Uh, it's not uncommon to have reps in there helping, but you need to be the doctor, you need to be the expert, <clears throat> and patients really do appreciate that. Uh, and you really will scare them off if, if you 
bring a rep in and say, I don't know what I'm doing. The rep's going to help us today. Um, I'm new at this. You know, good luck with your eyes. The other thing, too, is we get a lot of phone calls in my office because of the work we do online from educated patients. Patients who find us online typically have done a lot of research. And patients who call your office uh, asking about what you can do for keratoconus or scleral lenses already know at least the, the, the tip of the iceberg about it. And when they're calling you, half of what they're doing is probably not just immediately wanting to schedule an appointment and hand you cash. They want to call you and, and, and find out what you know about it. And are you the right place for them? And that really starts up front with the person who answers the phone. They don't need to be an expert in scleral lens, but everybody needs to know what a scleral lens is, what its indications are, what it's used for, who, who it's used for, and, and what the general kind of uh, advantages of scleral lenses are. You can have a script written up front. It doesn't matter. But you need to be able to capture 100% of the patients that, that you've attracted from whatever you did online or from a, a surgeon. If it's a referral case where they're a surgeon sending you a patient, they're probably going to come in. But if somebody finds you online, they're testing you from the first time they talk to your front desk to the, the second they get in the room with you. You need to have the confidence and the expertise to make them feel comfortable the whole way. And, and it all starts with your staff up front. And the other thing that really makes you look good is literature. I know I have brochures from Excel on the Atlantis lens. Anybody I just talk to about the Atlantis lens with, I'll hand a, a brochure to them. They take that home with them. It, it sticks with them. They say, this person must do these a lot. They have literature right here in the office. And then I have folders that I give to them at dispensing that has their fit agreement in there. It has a, a handout you can get from sclerolens.org. That's the Sclerolens Society's website uh, that, that goes over uh, what kind of solution to fill a lens with, how to clean it, frequently asked questions, and all those types of things. And I'll just close by saying I, I mentioned earlier I, I started out working at an ODMD practice that did a lot of refractive surgery. I know you all have co-managed refractive surgery or cataract surgery or everything where, you, where, where the biggest thing you can do, the best thing you can do for your patient is be positive and, and always just say, that's okay, we'll figure it out, this will get better, this is how it's supposed to go, those types of things. Obviously, when, when that's in reason, uh, especially lenses are no different, and, and you and your staff have to understand that. If it, somebody calls, some of panics because something happened to their scleral, or it's not comfortable, they're not seeing well. Just say, yeah, we'll figure that out for you. Why don't you come in? You know, we we can we can we'll fix that for you. It, it's always just about having the right attitude to make that patient feel like you know what you're doing, you're the expert, and, and eventually you you will be, even if you're not yet. And I'm sure a lot of you already are. But having that positive attitude from again front desk all the way back to you will make you a lot better practitioner and, and, and increase the amount of referrals you get uh, from your scleral lens patients who tell other people about your lenses. I get a lot of referrals for scleral lenses that aren't even from irregular corneas. It's just people who haven't been able to wear a contact for one reason or another. They have regular corneas, whether they were dry or they had astigmatism. They tell their friends, this guy can give, gave me this magical contact. He can do it for you too. Uh, and, and having that great experience from start to finish is what's going to allow you to uh, to earn their trust and get their referrals. So that's all I have. Like I, said, I know we went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I, I believe Ken's going to email it out tomorrow to you so you have a copy. Kathy, do we have uh, any questions? Um, um, yeah, we have a couple so far. Um, the first one, would you um, kind of review again um, how to set your fitting charge um, or the fees and do you take into account patient care packages, um, you know, as far as solutions, K3 wedding drops, et cetera? Um, are those included in your overall cost or are those in addition to? Yeah, I'll go back to that slide here real quick. <clears throat> and uh, everything's included in, in my fitting fee. What I give them is I give them sample solutions. I, I put every scleral lens patient on clear care and I just give them clear care samples. I'll give them each. Uh, two insertion and two removal DMVs, and we give them a few samples of um, lacquer pure. And then we give them the option to either purchase lacquer pure through us, purchase lacquer pure uh, online, or we can call in nebulizing solution, which we explain is off label but is cheaper. And then they can make the decision whether they want to do on or off label. And on our uh, handouts we give to the patient, we make sure we circle the fact that it's off label. Uh, if they want to do it, though, it does work good. It's worked good for a long time. It's just a liability thing for us that we do that. But, yeah, we basically give them samples of everything, uh, and then they're kind of responsible for right off the bat. They're either buying lacquer pure or we'll call that nebulizing solution into their pharmacy, and they'll go pick it up. They'll go buy some clear care. Uh, so I don't really give them anything that's revenue uh, right off the bat without them purchasing it, but I do give them samples of everything that they will need. 
Also, in the handout, I give them like I show them how to buy DMV inserters and removers offline on Amazon, and like what to search for and, and what to um, how much the price should be, and, and so making sure they're getting the right thing as far as that goes. As far as the fee goes, it's eight hundred dollars includes a fit and follow up care, and, and I don't think I put it in. The, the fit part, it's basically until it gets it right, but basically it's about 90 days. Rarely does it take that long. <clears throat> that part's non-refundable, and the lenses are $450 per eye. And you make sure you tell them that's got a 90-day uh, warranty on it. We have to make all our changes within 90 days. Outside of that, uh, you have to buy a new lens because that's what the lab will usually give you is 90 days. Okay, great. Um, how about um, would you – fit this lens on a marginal dry eye patient with seemingly regular corneas and what's the cutoff? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and you know, that's that's going to vary so much by, by patient expectations and personality. If they're marginally dry, there's a lot of really good dry eye lenses out there now. You know, there's uh, a lot of soft contacts that, that do great with dry eye and I might try to treat their dry eye. If they're um, if they've said they've tried it all and they're looking for the next step, then that's when I'm probably going to give them uh, the option of a scleral lens, but you know, it's it, it's just kind of gauging what their level of motivation is. And I think it's always important to talk about all options. And and I think with sclerals especially, if you see a patient who would be a good candidate, but you know they're probably not going to jump right into it, plant the seed at the first time you see them, or the, the first visit, and say, "There's another option. Let's try this this special type of soft lens, this extreme H two O, whatever we might use." Uh, but if that fails, we have this other option in the form of this hard lens that will correct your astigmatism. It'll give you way better vision than a soft lens will. You know, it'll treat your dry eye. Downside is it's kind of pricey, and you know it's a little bit of, of a more pain to, to put in and take out. There's a few downsides to it too, uh, but let's try this first. And you can kind of walk through the steps and let them lead themselves to a scleral lens, as opposed to just trying to just putting them in that when when you didn't exhaust all the other options and they kind of wonder what else was out there. Okay, next question: What is DMARC? DMARC, yeah, it's durable medical equipment, something or another, and basically it's Medicare's um, materials subset. So in other words, if you need to order something like <clears throat> a, a prosthetic leg or a breathing machine or whatever it might be that's a material and not a service necessarily or a surgery or an exam or something like that, Medicare shoves that out through DMARC, from what I understand exactly. but. Uh, for our purposes, it's rarely used. <clears throat> Another example in optometry would be that one pair of glasses you get after cataract surgery through Medicare. You can't bill that unless you bill it through DMERC because it's a material supply and it's not a service. So DMERC is Medicare's way of separating the two supplies you would use for anything medical versus uh, services. And Medicare is the only insurance company that I know of that, that has that separation. Like I said, that, that scleral shell code I built through many different commercial plants and never had an issue with coverage on. Uh, but Medicare, they just require you to go through DMR because it's an actual material and not a service. Okay. Uh, next question is how to build the Medicare or medical insurance for scleral shell for dry eye? Yep, yeah, I'll go to that slide here. And it's just going to be two lines right here. Um, two lines. If you uh, two lines, if you're fitting two eyes, <laughs> so you'll have a right and a left eye. B2627 RT for right, B2627 LT for left, and those are bundled codes. So again, so in my example, I uh, I charge $1,700 total for a bilateral fit, 450 per lens, 800 for the fitting. That's $1,700 total. I just split that in half and put 850 on one eye and 850 on the other because these are bundled codes. They include services and materials in them. So you'll include both the contact lens and your fit for right eye and left eye, if that kind of makes sense. So that's, your, that's all you do. If you only fit in one eye, it'll just be one line, B2627 with either the RT or LT modifier after that. And then just connect it to a dry eye code. There are some other codes that'll go with it. I, I don't know exactly what they are. I always just do dry eye because that's why I fit it. Um, you can be more specific on the type of dry eye, like MGD. I'm not really sure how that works, but the, the definition is dry of diverse etiology, so I'm not sure they really care what the dry is caused from, just the fact that you need to lock that moisture onto the surface all day. Uh, and there's a whole, if you just look up scleral shell, um, CMS, it gives you a very long definition of what it is, but essentially it's just you're, you're holding an aqueous type solution on the eye all day because the eye is not capable of doing it itself. Okay, 
Okay. Uh, next question is, do you bill 92072 for a patient with PMD? Yeah, that, the, the fact that there's no code that I know of for pellucid marginal degeneration tells me that I bill it the same as keratoconus. And so I, from a billing standpoint, I treat those patients like keratoconic patients. I guess the only thing you could do is corneal ectasia, but I kind of view PMD as a subset of keratoconus. It's very similar in a lot of different ways. It's just a slightly different pattern of keratoconus. So I, I would probably build under 92072, but I could see how you could argue that either way. I don't know 100% the, the answer to that. Okay. Uh, next question, what is your opinion on scleral topography for fitting over blebs or pinguecula and notching? Uh, if you're talking about the scleral topography where like the, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but, but yeah, I think that that's one area where it, it's really beneficial to, to be able to uh, measure the, the topography of the sclera itself as opposed to just the, the cornea when you have those issues. Glebs are the ones that are most risky just because, again, you're dealing with pressure changes there. Um, for the most part, though, you can notch around a lot of things without having to get very fancy with it. In fact, with Excel, I know I, I call them and ask for a 2 by 2 notch, 2 millimeter by 2 millimeter notch, and that'll fit around pretty much most any obstacle that I have, in my way, whether it's a pinguecula or a filtering bleb or what have you. And if it doesn't, I can tell them I'll make it a little bit bigger, and I'll send that same lens back, and they'll just bevel it out for you. Um, I found uh, scleral topography to be most beneficial on patients who just have very irregular uh, ocular surfaces. And, and typically it's secondary to some sort of disease state, but um, patients who just have uh, toricity within that sclera that's not regular uh, for one reason or another. But if it's just one little obstacle, I'll order a standard lens, fit it normally, and ask for it with a notch. And then the patient just has to learn to insert it properly where that notch goes around the, the obstacle. Okay. Uh, next question. If the patient has three diopters of astigmatism but does not have keratoconus, can you bill VSP as medically necessary? Uh, VSP, I don't think you can anymore. I, I, don't, I can't find anywhere in VSP where that anisometropia is covered. Now, that would be covered technically under IMED because they'll allow you to do anisometropia in any meridian of three diopters or greater. Um, and that would technically qualify there. I don't think VSP does that anymore, though. I could be wrong. I've, I have not done it, though. Um, but I know IMED would up to $700. VSP, I think they used to do that. I don't think they do that anymore. Okay. Um, and do you bill um, the RK patient the same as a cone patient? Uh, cash pay, yes. Um, and the only difference I would do for, for like, vision necessary is in the diagnosis code. You know, with RK, I usually use H H17.89, um, the corneal opacity code, but I'll definitely bill them the same. Um, uh, cash pay, yes, I'll charge them the same. And I'll, I'll even charge a regular cornea, typically the same. Um, I do have a, a special package I do for regular multifocal patients to make it a little bit more aggressive price-wise in comparison to a soft multifocal. But I compare it to a soft daily disposable multifocal price, not a soft monthly <clears throat> because you're just not going to compete with that in the scleral lens realm. So I do have a package there, but uh, for the most part, I, I charge the same price across the board no matter who's getting fit in the scleral. Okay. Um, Drew or Andrew, that looks like that's it for our questions tonight. Um, you can access again this on our website. Um, it, is, it has been recorded. Um, and please look for the communication on our series for next year. Um, thank you very much and good night. Thank you.